Yes, not far from you. And don't be confused by the last few weeks. We've been talking about things out in the universe and how big the universe is. And it seems like, well, God must be really far away. And no, he's not. No, he's not. And we don't understand the spiritual part of that. Someday we will. Someday we will. Let's ask God's blessing on the message. Father, we praise your name today. Father, we're just thrilled that we have your word. And we're asking you to open up to us what we need to know today, Father. Would you bless us with that uh, opening of our minds to your word. Send the Holy Spirit to just teach us. Teach us. Not that it be my words, that it be your words. Not Use my voice. Let it be your words, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we've been talking about the amazing God now for, this is week number four. You know me. I like to do things in a series. So, um, we are on week number four. We'll be wrapping it up next week, I think. Uh, at least that's the plan, uh, part five. But t today is part four. Just to give everybody up to speed a little bit, we started out with understanding things of the universe and how vast the universe is. That's why I made that comment about you know God not being far away. It might seem like he is, but he created all of the galaxies. And so we, we serve a very vast and a very large God. But he doesn't leave us with that. He also is very intricately involved with you, right down to your DNA, right down to who you are. And the fact that we have a billion characters, there's like no way that you could be recreated and be another person. There can't be another you. There simply cannot be another you. There's no other person who's ever lived that is like you or ever will. The, the possibilities and the combinations are just too endless for that to happen. Now, you might run into somebody that looks like you. I've run into people that I thought was somebody else. You ever do that? Okay, so in appearances sometimes. But we're all so very different. It goes far, far um, than uh, just the looks. And the other thing we learned from that lesson is the, the lesson of the protein molecule called laminin that is the cell adhesion molecule that holds our bodies together. And it's shaped like a cross, and it's just kind of interesting that God would, would have us find that. It's like we're finding God in places we never expected. So God is so intricately involved in your life right down to the cellular level. So starting with that, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. We went from that to the fact that you are made in God's image. You are in the likeness of God. Okay, so he gave us a mind. He gave us the ability to make choices and decide and be creative and to learn and to communicate and do all these other things that the rest of creation cannot do to that level. And so God created us with this very special uh, ability to be in his image, in his likeness. Okay, from there though, we went to the next step. Remember what I said last week, but there's more, right? <laughs> and there is more. We learned about the Spirit of God because God fully intends for you and I to receive his Spirit. But here's the thing this one's a choice, okay? This one's a choice. It doesn't come built in when you're born. It comes as a result of the choice because there's another choice. For example, besides the spirit of God, which is called the spirit of truth, there is the spirit of darkness that our spiritual enemy wants to speak to you through. And both spirit of truth and the spirit of darkness want to speak into your life. And so there's this choice that has to be made. And we talked about Jesus' baptism. Remember that? We talked about how in baptism, he showed us what that would be like when the dove descended on him. It was, it was like showing us ahead of time that the spirit was going to come. And that was something that he actually demonstrated. So, last week, that's what we talked about. This is where you are. But... Because of repentance and baptism, we receive the Spirit of God from on high. It comes from God, and it's there so that Jesus can continue to teach you. We talked about last week how Jesus wants to continue to teach you, and he does it through the Holy Spirit. Okay? So that kind of catches us up. But there's more. <laughs> the amazing God has more for you 
And this is gonna take maybe a little different direction because we're thinking of building blocks, okay? And I don't have room on my screen for another building block, do I? So we're gonna come from a different direction. God has something for you that he wants you to know because if he's given us a mind to be taught, it's because he wants to teach us something. And what is that? What does he want to teach you? What does he want you to know? What does God want you to know now that he can communicate with you, now that he can speak into your life through the Holy Spirit, and it's Jesus doing that speaking, what is it that he wants you to know? And, of course, we can come up with all kinds of things, can't we? There's a lot of things that he wants us to know. But one thing kind of stood out to me because it seems to be the basis of everything else. All right? And it's engulfed in a story that we're going to read in Luke chapter 15. Jesus tells a story that tells us something about God and what God wants you to know. And Jesus is telling this story to a group of people who... Um, had different ideas about God. They had ideas about how important it was to obey God and to gain his favor that way. But Jesus was trying to tell a story about the people who were on the other side that uh, were not uh, at the level that the religious leaders believed that they were. So he tells a series of stories called The Lost uh, Sheep, The Lost Coin, and The Lost Son. We're going to go over The Lost Son today, and maybe you've heard this story before. Maybe you've read it a hundred times, or maybe you've never read it. But there's a something in here that I want you to see that's the next thing that God wants you to know. All right? So in the story, starting in Luke uh, 15 verse 11 it says Jesus continued he's, he's telling several stories he says there was a man who had two sons the younger one said to his father father give me my share of the estate so he divided his property between them now the people listening to this story would have thought that this would have been like really really terrible a terrible thing because to say I want my share of the estate is like saying um I want my inheritance now. I want my money and I want it now. You've heard that before. It's almost like saying, I wish you were dead. Very serious. So the people listening to the story obviously would be uh, thinking that this story, um, this is a really bad thing in that culture. You would never do that. Okay, and the other thing that's noteworthy is the father, he did it. He divided the property. He, he actually did it. And he divided the property for his two sons and gave it to them. All right? Going on in the story, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Other translations say wasted. Uh, he blew it. He blew it all. In wild living, so you can probably imagine what that might be. He squandered everything in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. Now, he didn't count on this happening, and many times we don't, right? We don't plan ahead. We don't, we don't leave the possibility that something could go wrong. So the famine came, and now he has nothing, and he's in need. He's not with family. He, he's not with, uh, he doesn't have a job, and he's in a faraway place. Kind of a scary time. Verse 15, so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Now, you've got to understand, Jesus is telling this story to a group of Jews. Some are Pharisees, and some are disciples who, who want to learn, but in that culture, pigs were like the worst possible animal. You, you didn't even touch a pig. In, in, in that culture, you didn't even own pigs. So this is scraping the bottom of the barrel right here. Okay, He's got to deal with the pigs. And he's not at the bottom yet, as you'll see. But he he's, gets his job to feed the pigs. Okay, This is, this is rather... Uh, uh, disgusting thing. Verse 16, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So it's, it's even worse. 
The pigs are bad enough, but they're eating better than he is. I mean, this is really bad. And you know, sometimes, sometimes we've got to hit bottom, don't we? Sometimes we've got to hit bottom before we learn a lesson. And I think, he's, I think he's there. I think he's at the bottom, okay? When he came to his senses, okay, and that's what it took to come to his senses, okay? And if you've ever made these kind of foolish mistakes, and had to come to your senses. You kind of know where he's at. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. So he's thinking about home. He's thinking about his father. And he's thinking about even the servants that his father has have it way better than him. So he came to his senses. He says, I will set out and go back to my father. Okay, there it is. Go back to my father. That is the perfect definition of repentance. It's not just being sorry for something. It's, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to go a new way. He says, I'm going back to my father. That had to be a very humiliating decision to make. Okay, after the fuss that he stirred up when he left. I'm going to go back to my father. And I'm going to say to him, Father... I have sinned against heaven and against you. Okay, so you feel that, that sorrow coming over him. In repentance, there's sorrow. And he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He says, I don't even expect to be, I don't even expect to be back in your graces as your son anymore. After all, I spent your inheritance. It's gone anyways, Right? So he says, make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. He does it. He actually gets up and he goes. He went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. The fact that the father was looking for him, saw him from a distance, kind of tells us that maybe he was looking for him waiting for the day that maybe he would return. But he was filled with compassion. That's a very, very important attribute because what Jesus is doing here in this story, he's using the Father in the story to represent our Father in heaven who has compassion. Okay? He was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. This is the son that, that said, you know, in one way, I wish you were dead. And he comes back home. And instead of the father sitting there and saying, yeah, this better be good. I can't wait to hear what he's got to say. No, he's filled with compassion. He hasn't even heard his little speech yet. He's running towards him. And I got to tell you when, you, when you have a story where you have a dad who has servants and he's running to his son, that is like the most undignified thing that you could think of. So the people listening to the story are saying, what? Yeah, he ran to his son and he kissed him, put his arms around him, Right? The son said to him, okay, here comes his speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Well, he's right. He's right. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But I got a feeling the dad wasn't listening to this, okay? Because look what happens. He says, but after the father... Uh, But the father said to his servants, and I think he was kind of ignoring his son. His father says to his servant, he doesn't even answer his son. He says to his servants, he says, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Now, that might not mean much to you, but in that culture, that was a big deal. We're going to treat you with the things that we would give to somebody that was very, very important. Most people had these things in case an important guest stopped by. They would be able to welcome that very important guest with things like brand new sandals because if you're walking around Judea in the sand, your sandals wear out rather quickly. Brand new sandals, a ring, that denotes 
a ring is kind of like, you belong to me, okay? And put on a, the very best robe. So this is the father's response. I don't think it had much to do with the speech because he was always, already running down the road before he ever heard the speech. He said, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Okay, so I'm sure PETA fans probably aren't thrilled by this one, but in this culture, this is what they did. They, they, had, they usually had an animal that was ready to go, fattened, you know, by the way they feed the, feed the, uh, the animal. And a calf, is, a calf would be the, the very prime meat. Sorry, PETA folks. And uh, the fattened means the very best. They, they would have fed this calf for such an occasion like this. This is like the, the occasion of the year. Okay, let's have a feast and celebrate. <clears throat> for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. I want you to notice, he didn't say, I really liked his speech, and I believe what he said, and I'm going to give him another chance. No. He said, this son of mine. Remember, he said, I'm not worthy to be your son, but he proclaims him as his son. Puts a ring on his finger and makes a big deal about this. This son of mine was dead and is alive. That's why the father was so he was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. They began to celebrate. Big party. Okay? Now the son could have said, you know, I probably shouldn't go into the celebration. I don't deserve that. But it implies that they all celebrated together. It was a choice. And he says, okay. <laughs> And they begin to celebrate, okay? Meanwhile, back at the ranch, because something else was going on in the background, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. The older son was doing what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to be out doing what his father tells him to do. He's out in the fields. He's working his tail off, right? And he came near the house, and he hears music and dancing? And I'm not invited? Okay, what's going on here? He says he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. And he didn't even know about it. And I'm sure he felt a little, yeah, ticked off. Would you, is that how you'd feel, ticked off? Yeah. Um, maybe a little resentful? What's going on? And, the, and this is what the servant says. Your brother has come. Oh, my brother. He replied, and your father has fil killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. See, even the servant knew it wasn't the speech he gave. He has him back safe and sound. I want you to remember that. That's going to show up later as we talk more, but he has him back safe and sound. Makes me think of the song we just sang uh, where he takes us in his, his arms um, how did the words go in that song? Uh, we just sang uh, I, Friend of Jesus. He takes him in his arms and it, was there, uh, it implied that cherish him and I forget the exact wording now. But anyways, I thought of that when he said he takes him back safe and sound. He says, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. He's not going in the celebration. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Okay. So it's kind of an insult that the father has to come out and talk to the son, but he does. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. He always did what he was supposed to do. He was the good son. You got a brother or sister who's the good one, and, or maybe you're the good one and the brother or sister's like the bratty one. You, know, you all know where you fall in that, okay? Yeah, we know, oh, we know we're Trish. <laughs> How easy it is to point to others. But <laughs> so he says, I've been slaving for you all these years. I never even disobeyed your orders. You never once gave me even a young goat. Now, a young goat is kind of lean and, and, and I don't know. The meat's okay, but it's chewy. It's, it's not the fatted calf, okay? You wouldn't even give me a young, tough, skinny goat. 
all right, after all I did, so I could celebrate with my friends. I mean, he's got a point, doesn't he? He's got a point. I mean, I probably feel the same way. But when this son of yours, notice he says, he's not my brother. When this son of yours, I, maybe that's happened in your, in your family setup as well. When this son of yours, right, who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fat and calf. And chances are, the older brother was part of the process of fattening up the calf with feed and everything. He's probably getting this calf and thinking, boys, one day we're going to enjoy this calf. And here the father <laughs> celebrates with the youngest son, not his brother, but this son of yours, right? My son, the father said. Okay, the dad begins to talk now. He says, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. The father was compassionate to the older son too and he, I think he understood his point. But he says, look, everything I have is yours. The, the rest is all squandered. Everything I have is yours, he says. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours... <laughs> This brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So the emphasis is that he came back and he's, he's safe and sound. Okay? He's safe and sound. Because wasn't that what the, what the servant said to the older brother? Your brother's come home and he's safe and sound. That's the emphasis. The father is thrilled that he is safe and sound. Okay? I want to go back to this right here. Back in verse 20, when, when the young man said he got up and he went to his father, right? But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. I want you to notice it wasn't the speech, okay? He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Do you think the father forgave his son? Do you think there was forgiveness here? It was already there. Long before the son even had a chance to say anything, the father was already filled with compassion and maybe even looking for the day that his son would return. And he was filled with compassion. That's a, an amazing quality that we struggle with ourselves. We struggle with ourselves, okay? If you look at the two sons, the younger son and the older son, the difference is amazing. The younger son returns in humiliation. He hits bottom, right? But he says, I'm going to go back. That's repentance, the going back part. Okay? The older son, he obeys his father. He didn't do anything wrong. He was the good son. The younger son, the father was filled with compassion for him. But also for the older son, he was also filled with compassion for him too, for both sons. So the father's part in this is the same. But for the younger son, forgiveness had already happened. It was already given. Long before he had a chance to say, I'm really sorry. Right? I mean, it's clear in the story. For the older son, forgiveness wasn't necessary. He didn't do anything wrong. He was doing all the right stuff. Got it? And they all celebrated together. And the younger son went in to be part of it. He could have said, I don't deserve this, but no. They all celebrated together. But for the older son, his pride, his pride keeps him from the celebration. So I, want, I want to point that out, especially these bottom two here. They celebrate together, and yet the older son separates himself because his pride keeps him from the celebration. I, the point I want to make at this point in the story is that the older son didn't need forgiveness, did he? And yet he doesn't take part in the celebration. The younger son did need forgiveness and did take part in the celebration. And I think sometimes we have it in our mind that forgiveness from God equals salvation. Well, not necessarily. Forgiveness of God is something that God has done for us, but that doesn't mean you're in the celebration. There's a choice to be made there. 
Okay? They were already, he, the, the older son didn't, didn't require forgiveness. The younger son received forgiveness, but only the younger son went into the celebration. So there's a disconnect between forgiveness and salvation or celebrating. Okay, I want you to make, get that clear, that the forgiveness part of it is already done. Okay? The younger son experienced humiliation. That caused him to be repentant. The older son is suffering from pride now, so he has a new problem now. He's got a, something that he's got to deal with, right? Yeah. Um, how would this look in a modern setting? Because we don't often hear about kids coming to their parents and saying, I want my inheritance. Give it to me so I can go to a faraway country and squander it. That's typically not what happens, but what many times does happen is we have in our families sometimes a son or a daughter who leaves, and usually it's out of, I don't know, anger, don't like the rules, something like that. And, and many of us have experienced that either with our kids who just decided to leave because they got mad or something, or maybe you're one of the ones that when you were young that you left home? Is that possible? And a lot of times it doesn't have to do with inheritance, it just has to do with something that has happened and made us angry. I want to play this short video for you and I want you to notice that in the modern story, same kind of story, but it really centralizes around the dad. And I want you to, I want you to with this story, I want you to catch the compassion because that's really the, the thing of the story. That's the thing that God is adding to us today that is the basis of his grace, the basis of his forgiveness, the basis of his wanting to be with you is his compassion. So let's watch this video and really key in on the dad, okay? Key in on the dad. And if anybody needs a Kleenex, they'll be up front. How's that? Okay, <laughs> Kleenex alert, all right? Nicole, you'll have the Kleenexes. Okay. Hey, everybody. Let's Pastor take a look. Grant here. The video we watched on Sunday for the sermon time uh, got off YouTube, and we don't have the copyright uh, to be able to rebroadcast that on this YouTube. So if you want to see that video, uh, it's about the prodigal son. You can search for it on YouTube called The Prodigal Son, uh, colon, When God Ran. It's on the YouTube channel Arex, A-R-E-X-M-C. And you can watch that video and see what, what it was that we were watching here. All right. Uh, sorry we can't rebroadcast it, but that's just the way it is. All right. So back to the video. God bless you. you to think about the dad in the story. It was like he was preparing for his return the whole time and he couldn't wait and he kept looking out the window. Two years had gone by and he's still waiting for that moment when he will be reunited with his son and we don't even know what it was about. Did you notice the other son, the, the brother? It wasn't, it wasn't as bright in the, in the video but he was the good son. He was doing all the right things. He was doing his homework. He, was, he helped his dad, but he didn't understand why his brother would get such great treatment after what he had done, whatever that was. It's the compassion in that story that comes through, and that's what's supposed to come through in the story of Jesus that's telling about the two sons, okay? Okay. The dad is filled with compassion for him. He's already forgiven him. He hasn't heard a speech. He hasn't, they haven't talked about it. He hasn't decided if it was a good enough reason for him to come home. He was looking for him to come home because he was filled with compassion. Okay? 
in Isaiah 66, verse 2. This is from the last couple of weeks. This is kind of a, the verse I keep carrying forward each, each week, so it'll be familiar with you. But this is what God is looking for. This is the very thing he's looking for. Those who are humble, those who have a contrite spirit and tremble at my word. God is looking for the humble. The older son that does everything right, that's great, but there's something about reaching a point where you know you need God in your life and you come to him. You come to him. Okay? So when God starts us out this way, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. He makes us in his image so that we can reason, think, choose, decide. Even if that means we go to a far country and squander everything, we still get to make that decision, right? But it's God's desire that we would reach out to him, be humble, and then receive, because of that, the spirit of God so that God can teach us directly. He wants you to know his compassion. Compassion is the baseline for everything else, for his grace, his forgiveness, salvation that he wants to give to you. He has deep compassion for you and for me and for each one of us, okay? We're gonna close with John chapter 10 because in John chapter 10, Jesus again talking, again speaking, and again instructing, he, he nails it with these two verses. He just he encapsulates everything that... The father is after, okay? He says this, he says, my sheep, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. You see, that's because of the component that he adds the spirit of God to speak into your life so that you can listen, so that you can follow, okay? My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me, Jesus says. And he says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. That's huge. Makes me think of John 3.16. Everybody heard of John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, right? That's the forgiveness piece. God so loved the world. He's done this for the world. But the next part is the choice piece, isn't it? For those who believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's what I think of here. There is a choice to be made, and the choice is to be made in a humble heart, contrite spirit, reaching out for God, in repentance, which is demonstrated by the younger son, in such a way that you come to God. You come to him, all right? And he says, I will give them eternal life and they shall never perish, all right? This is, no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one will snatch them out of my hand. That word snatch in the Greek has a uh, violent connotation to it. No one can rip them, steal them, take them, lie to them and grab them. Remember what the servant said to, to the oldest son about your brothers come home and he is safe and he is sound. That's what God's after, for you to be safe and sound. Now, now you still have choice, don't you? You can leap out of his hand and you can go to a far country and waste it all. But nobody can take you out of the hand of Jesus or the Father. All right, that's a promise from God. And it comes from listening and following. That's where this component from last week comes in that is so critical, the receiving of the Spirit of God so that he can teach us, so we can listen, so we can follow. All right? God wants you to know his compassion. He wants you to know that you are safe. He wants you to know that he has you. And so the God of the universe is literally holding you together. The star-breathing God wants to hold you together and keep you safe so that no one can take you out of his hand. That's what God desires for your life and for everyone's life around you. And we pray for everyone around us to come to this knowledge of 
repentance and the receiving of the Spirit of God. Okay? Some takeaways, some things to take home to kind of summarize everything. First and foremost, what does God want you to know? He wants you to know his deep compassion. It's the basis of everything else. It's the basis of his grace. It's the basis of his forgiveness. He has deep compassion. We, we have a little bit of compassion. If, if like the dad in the story and like you and I, if we're in that situation, we tend to feed a lot of our energy into the, the problem child, right? And the one who's doing well tends to not get as much attention. Well, that's because we are limited in our ability to be compassionate. God is not limited. God has infinite compassion for everyone. He wants you to know that. He wants you to feel it. He has the compassion. These are the ones I look upon with favor, God says. Those who are humble of a contrite spirit and tremble at my word. This, this is the attitude he's looking for. Notice he's not looking for those who plead the best case and the best speech on asking for forgiveness. He's looking for a humble heart, a contrite spirit, tremble at his word. Okay, He wants us to listen and to follow. That implies that we are receiving from God through the Spirit of God the instructions from God and we are listening and we're following in his ways. And last of all, he wants you to know, I have you. I've got you. And no one's going to take you away from me. He wants you to know that. I've got you. He wants you to feel safe and secure it with him. That's an amazing thing. Our amazing God, who's creator of the universe, who's created you as intricate as you are, who's given you the ability of mind and has given you the spirit of God if you come to him in repentance, in a humble heart, a contrite spirit, and through that process and through baptism, he gives the spirit of God and he wants to teach you. He wants you to listen. He wants you to follow. And he's... He's holding you together, whether it's the cellular level he's holding you together or whether it's in the spirit realm, he's holding you together. He doesn't want you to perish. He wants to give you eternal life. That's our amazing God. That's where he is. That's what he wants you to know. We serve an amazing God. We serve a God who is beyond what we're able to, even capable of thinking of what he wants for your life. So these are the things that I, I know. It's winter time. It's the time of year where we tend to be discouraged. We need to be encouraged by our amazing God, okay? And so that's why I decided to talk about these things so that we can be amazed by God. Let's thank him right now. Father in heaven, we praise you. We just want to say thank you for the fact that you are an amazing God, that you've given to us amazing capabilities and you want to give us more you, your spirit to teach us and guide us you want us to listen and to follow you and father you want us to be safe in your hands so that no one not our spiritual enemy not another person nothing else will grab us from you because we're listening and we're following father these are amazing things that you're teaching us. Help us to absorb them. Help us to, to grasp them. And Father, when we fall down, when we're like the son who had to go away and realize we've blown it, when we do that, Father, give us strength and courage to come back to you. Father, we just ask that special blessing. And we want to say thank you for your grace and compassion. It's in Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen. All right. Oh, well, we had a little music to go with that. <laughs> I was getting ready to start tapping my toes. We're going to sing a song of celebration because God wants you close to him. He wants you safe in his hands, yes, but he wants you close to him. He wants you to come to him, and he's not going to let go of you. He wants you to know of his deep compassion for your life. This song celebrates that, okay? Think about the compassion of God and think about those choices. We do choose between the darkness of the world or the spirit of truth from God. That is an absolute choice that we need to make, 
all right? And we need to let the Spirit of God reign in our lives so that we make the choices that, and stay safe in his hand, that we don't jump out and go to a far country. Don't go to a far country, folks, okay? Stay in his hand and listen and follow, okay? Let's celebrate with this song. Thank you.